A war is raging in Mexico's border towns as rival drug cartels battle for control. In the scene of horror. The Mexican government has declared its own war on the drug barons. It seems powerless to stem the tide of bloodshed. The drug gangs here are as heavily armed as the security forces. Not in a million years would I expect to find something like this here in Mexico. People come here on a holiday. Thousands have died or simply disappeared, mourned by their families. I need to know what happened with my son. It's all about supplying thousands of tons of cocaine and cannabis to the United States. This is the man behind much of the violence. Chapo Guzman is the world's most powerful drug lord and Mexico's most wanted man. Welcome to Tijuana, tequila, sexo, marijuana. Welcome to Tijuana. This is Tijuana. Mexico's most notorious border town. For decades, it was a magnet for American tourists, seeking easy, seedy pleasures away from home. But tourists no longer feel welcome here. It wasn't long before I saw why. Hola, ¿qué pasó aquí exactamente? Un muerto. Eh, eh, ¿Se lo sabe quién, quién era? No, 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 todavía. No. This man with no name was my first encounter with violent death in Mexico, and I had only just arrived. Rival drug cartels use murder and terror in their battle for control of the city, a key gateway into America. I'm mostly shocked, actually, the fact that there are not that many people crowding around to see what's happened. Because there's just been a murder taking place here. There's loads of restaurants around here, loads of people, lights. It's not some dark alleyway. Are they just so used to murders here that they just shrug their shoulders? Or is it an indication of how violent this city really is, that people don't want to come anywhere near, they don't want to be seen on the scene? Seguimos con miedo. ¿Quieren seguir con ese miedo? ¿Qué es lo que nos puede pasar? ¿Qué nos puede pasar? Nada. Nos matan. This is a deeply religious country, but it's also a society gripped by fear. Executions and kidnaps are daily events in Mexico's border towns, where every parish is mourning its dead. Most crimes go unpunished, and those affected are often too scared to even talk. Los pecados. Espero la resurrección de los muertos y la vida del mundo futuro. Amén. Feeling abandoned by the authorities, many find strength in their faith. ¿Están dispuestos a luchar? Que viva mi Cristo, que viva mi Rey, que impere doquiera, triunfante su ley. Viva Cristo Rey, viva Cristo Rey. There have been more than 16,000 drug killings in the last three years alone. Authorities say it's just a case of criminals killing criminals, and they rarely investigate the murders. But is it that simple? I went to meet a family affected by the violence. They believe this country's victims are being ignored and have chosen to speak out for them. Hello. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? I'm Katia. Hi. I'm Fernando. Hi. Pleased to meet you, Fernando. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, Sandra. My wife. Nice to meet Pleased you. to meet you. She's Thank you for wife. having me in your home. Yeah, come on, come on. Thank you. Fernando Osegueda is a salesman. 
His wife, Sandra, no longer works. They have three children. The firstborn is called Fernando, like his father. Do you remember that when he started school? Yeah. It was exciting to go to school. When he wake up early the first day, he loved the school. Did he? Really? Yeah, that's he loved something, loved. I mean, that's unusual. Yeah, because yeah. my second one would say, I don't want to go to school. I don't yeah. want to go to school. He cry all the time. This is the last picture we have. Christmas Eve. Age 23, Fernando was about to graduate as an engineer. There was no hint of the trouble to come. But on the 10th of February 2007, everything changed. That day I was outside with my neighbors. The car came and stopped in front of the house. It looked like police officers, you know. You know, they have guns. Say so maybe they're looking for somebody here, my neighbors or something. They they start using the steps, and they open my door. They came in. I started yelling, "Why are you coming to my house? You need to show me something." As five men in police uniform barged into the house. Ten more stood guard by their cars. The neighbors retreated indoors. That day was my daughter in her room and one of my son, Fernando, was in his room. They go to the rooms, say, wake up, stand up. Say, but why, why you take him? They never told me anything. The men push us, my daughter and me, and they took him put in the car and go. Santa called me, and my surprise is, why, Fernando, why? And then he said, well, what can I do? I go to the police station, and I, I talk with the officer, say, somebody take my son, and I need to know if my son is here. And then, uh, where is the name? Blah, blah, blah. Fernando Segueda Ruelas. No, it's not here. Fernando realized the men in uniform had been criminals in disguise. But the real police were not exactly helpful. Fernando drove to six different police stations in Tijuana before he was allowed to file a missing persons report. I go to the Central Caminera, and Central Caminera tell me, no, this is not a pen to here. You need to go to the Zona Rio. I go to Zona Rio and say, no, you go to Florido. Florido, no. Uh, you go to the playas of Tijuana. My son disappeared completely and they don't want to know nothing. Fernando headed home, hoping the people who'd taken his son would get in touch. The police officer said, maybe this is a kidnap. You need to wait for the call. For now, we're still waiting for the call. No call. Nobody calls. Nobody called. To get to the source of the suffering of so many Mexicans like Fernando and Sandra, I needed to travel through Mexico's mountainous interior. Criminal organizations have thrived here for decades, smuggling narcotics north into the United States. The cost to the Mexican people, though, has never been this high. The public brutality of the killings has terrorized whole communities. And hundreds of people like Fernando and Sandra's son have simply disappeared. I traveled 900 miles south of Tijuana to a rarely visited part of the country, the state of Sinaloa. It's here that Mexico's drug trade was born on the lush tropical mountains of the Sierra Madre. Well, it's dusty, 
but it's also dangerous. There is no way we'd be able to travel through this country in or outside a car without coming with the army. This is the realm of the powerful Sinaloa drug cartel. Ambushes are not uncommon. Mexico is one of the biggest producers of marijuana in the world, and it's here that most of it is grown. The Mexican army took me on the marijuana trail. I'd like to say we can smell our way, but it's not quite true. I think we have about half an hour of this. At least I got rid of the heavy flak jacket. The army says we're in safe hands now. They say they've secured the area. The soldiers had recently discovered five hectares of cannabis plantations. To reach the fields meant a long and humid trek. I can smell it. Now I can smell it. Just imagine what it's going to be like when they start burning it. The Mexican army says it burnt hundreds of tons of marijuana last year. Yet more than 60% of the drug cartel's annual revenue, or an estimated $8 billion, is thought to come from sales of marijuana to the United States. You're eradicating, but there's still so many drugs being grown here in Mexico. In many of the cases, we don't manage to destroy all the drugs. And not in all the corners and all the points with the effectiveness that we have, we can get to the point where Hacemos nuestro mejor esfuerzo, erradicamos un gran número de plantíos, un gran número de hectáreas, pero faltan algunas que no alcanzamos a erradicar y son las que cosechan y son las que llegan a los consumidores. The man who profits from this vast illegal trade here in Sinaloa is the most wanted man in Mexico, Joaquín Guzmán Loera, better known as El Chapo. The illiterate son of marijuana growers, Chapo Guzman is believed to be hiding in these mountains where he was born. Chapo Guzman was born in a community that has always made a living from the drug trade. You need to understand this to understand why Chapo would enter this business when he was a child. This is a region where most people don't actually look down on the drug trade, but rather see it as a way to make a living, to survive. But the drug business in Mexico is now a massive criminal enterprise. It includes the trafficking of 90% of all the Colombian cocaine consumed in the United States. Profits are estimated at $15 billion a year. Rival drug cartels are fighting to control the lucrative border routes into the United States. One cartel is coming out on top. It's now one of the most powerful and violent drug trafficking organizations in the world the Sinaloa cartel of Chapo Guzman. Chapo and his men are blamed for much of the bloodshed in Mexico. To get rid of the drug trade in Mexico, you need to get rid of the bosses, right? And you've got the big boss, Chapo Guzman, who comes from here. Yo le, yo le digo lo que yo considero. Sí, y el avance que tenemos constantemente y el trabajo que hacemos con constancia, esfuerzo y determinación. ¿Y lo, eh, eh, Chapo Guzmán dónde está? No lo sé. ¿Usted tuvo la experiencia de estar cerca de él o con, con, no, no, con no, llamadas no, 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 que nunca, puede estar en Nunca, no, no. Y no sabemos exactamente dónde se encuentra. ¿Do you think he is here? No lo sé. Do you, think you'll, do you think you'll find him? ¿Will he find him? ¿Lo encontrará? Estimo que sí. At a nightclub in Sinaloa's capital, Culiacán, Chapo Guzman is celebrated in song. This one is called the Lord of the Mountain. It's a narco corrido, a traditional ballad about the lives and exploits of Mexico's drug lords. 
In this corrido, Chapo Guzman is a folk hero. Drug traffickers pay bands in Sinaloa and all over the country to compose corridos about them. Songs that defend them, glorify them and say they're very brave. Javier Valdez is a well-known newspaper columnist in Culiacán. He's also a vocal critic of Sinaloa's drug culture. When we talk about like the drug traffickers and the drug lords, I mean, Chapo Guzman is your drug lord, the drug lord of Culiacán. Is there something special about him? People admire him, they love him and give him protection. Because Chapo is from this area, but also because he has a lot of power and money, and he pays well. Culiacán is a dangerous place, but it's also a relatively prosperous city. The proceeds of drug trafficking are laundered into the region's economy and its infrastructure, seeping deep into the social fabric. We have relatives who are drug traffickers, neighbors, customers. The traffickers are in our kitchens, in our bedrooms, on our patios. They are amongst us because they benefit us. <laughs> Not everyone in Mexico is doing well. Far from it. The country is experiencing a deep recession. 40% of people here still live in poverty. Perhaps I shouldn't be surprised that drug trafficking is an attractive career path. I went to a local school to find out just how early Chapa Guzman's cartel begins recruiting. Hay chicas en la escuela eh, a quien impresiona la, en, de, en dinero pues las sí. coches. Sí, hay gente la que mayoría. Sí. sí. ¿Qué, ¿Qué buscan ellas? Pues dinero, que las mantengan bien, etc. El dinero. The money. Gracias a esto. Thanks to this job, I built my house. I furnished it. My wife has a car. Luis Navarez used to be a teacher. He was recently jailed for driving a lorry packed with marijuana from Sinaloa up to the U.S. border, something he'd been doing for 20 years. Why? Because on a teacher's salary, you lack many things. My sons have been to Disneyland in Los Angeles, to Universal Studios, to SeaWorld. Yes, I've lost years of my life, but I earned a lot. When I come out, I won't ever have to work again. It's a vicious circle. While the drug trade provides an income for many Mexicans, the chaos and the violence it brings are destroying the legitimate economies of the country's border towns. It's so sad to say it because it's my city and this used to be a, a boom street and now it's a, a ghost street. Um, most of the business in this street are now closed. Look, this is closed, that is closed, that one is for rent. For years, Tijuana was controlled by its own fearsome drug cartel. But as Chapo Guzman grew stronger in Sinaloa, so did his ambition to conquer Tijuana. The ongoing conflict recently erupted into the worst turf war this city has ever seen.
The cartel started a war that left an average of 12 dead per day. At times, all of them at once in the same place. Sometimes they would find five decapitated bodies here, one dismembered body there. It was horrible. Journalists are also caught up in the violence. Mexico is the world's most dangerous country for reporters after Iraq. Two editors of Zeta magazine have been assassinated, but Adela Navarro's publication continues to expose the cartel's crimes and the rampant corruption in Mexico. Between September 2008 and January 2009, there were 600 executions in Tijuana, and local police didn't do anything. Neither did the federal police. They did nothing. Many in Tijuana feel let down by the authorities. Fernando Osegueda never heard back from the police about his missing son. He joined a support group uniting families in similar situations. By now, most have given up hope of finding their loved ones alive. If rescue one teeth, the one bond, it's okay for us. And we go to, to the cemetery and put the body and the church in print, but we have uh, one place to go to pray to my son. This is the same case to everybody, people here. Two years after Fernando's son was abducted, a high-profile arrest appeared to be a breakthrough in the case. In January 2009, a man called Santiago Mesa was detained. A humble bricklayer from Sinaloa State, he'd migrated north to Tijuana, like many, in search of a job. He found one. Mesa confessed to disposing of the corpses of people kidnapped and then killed by the drug cartels. He said he dissolved the bodies and buried the remains in the grounds of his shack. Mesa became known as the Pozolero, the stew maker of the drug lords. I was so scared of hearing that. It's like a scary movie, you know. How can he say that? And he recognized he dissolved 300 bodies. And, and and then, then we, th we talk about maybe he can recognize somebody, but he say, maybe. It's incredible, but the most people renew the, the hope because in this, in this time, we need to know what's up with uh, Fernando or all the other, other people. Fernando stepped up his protests calling on the authorities to interrogate the stew maker about the identities of people he dissolved in acid. Si Santiago Mesa ya reconoció alguna persona, si Santiago Mesa este qué qué cuáles fueron sus declaraciones? y pues tener respuestas, eso venimos a traer respuestas. A, a... Está confirmada esa audiencia con el procurador. ¿Cómo es posible que esto ocurra en México? El pozolero o quien sea su similar en este momento en Baja California, las desintegra en Sosa, eh, Sosa, Sosa Cáustica. Sosa Cáustica. Es ese país en el que vivimos. Así están las cosas, señor presidente Calderón. Una con 27. Santiago Mesa confessed to having worked for years for the Tijuana cartel. But lately, he'd switched sides in Mexico's drug wars and begun plying his macabre trade for the men from Sinaloa, led by Chapo Guzman. It's the latest gruesome episode in a long-running turf war. Back in 1993, Chapo's first attempt to control Tijuana failed dramatically when a shootout with his rivals claimed an eminent victim. A top Mexican cardinal was killed in the crossfire. 
the Mexican government came under huge pressure to act, and Chapo Guzman was arrested. These were the first images Mexican people saw of him, a diminutive man who described himself as a farmer. In prison, Chapo's efforts to take over Tijuana were put on hold. Para entender, ¿quién es el Chapo? To understand Chapo and how he has become who he is today, I gained access to his medical file compiled at the maximum security prison. Journalist Annabel Hernandez showed me the document. It's one of thousands she's collected for a book about Chapo Guzman. Egocéntrico, es astuto. His psychiatric profile describes him as a professional criminal, astute, manipulative, charming, and highly dangerous. Chapa Guzman has charisma. He's a man who is capable of convincing God to sit down with the devil. These skills were soon put to good use. In January 2001, Chapo Guzman escaped from his maximum security prison cell. The official version is that he was smuggled out in a laundry cart. Presumably, I mean, CCTV cameras, I mean, they must have been everywhere. There's nothing? No haya habido ni una sola imagen. Nothing. There's not one single picture of when he escaped. Not one. He simply disappeared from a maximum security prison. If you ask me what I think, it needed to have been somebody very high up who could have authorized Chapo Guzman's escape. I don't imagine it could have been any other way. The escape marked the beginning of the Chapo Guzman legend. The US government offered a $5 million reward for the capture of a man who now appeared so powerful that the Mexican state couldn't touch him. It's Independence Day, and Mexico's President Felipe Calderón is reviewing his troops. Since taking office in 2006, Calderón has declared war on the drug cartels and deployed 50,000 soldiers and federal police in the country's drug hotspots. This attempt to restore the rule of law by armed force has seen an upsurge in violence. But the government defends its policy. There is no historical precedent for the effort being made in Mexico today. What we have done in number of arrests, the seizure of money and drugs, the drug bosses we have captured, has no precedent in the world. Not everyone agrees. They're talking about thousands of captures, but only 2% of those captures wind up with a final ruling establishing a guilty verdict. So you just do not have an effective repression. That's it. You don't have a real dismantling of the economic base of organized crime hidden within the legal economy of um, Mexico, where 78% of the GDP sectors of the legal economy have been infiltrated by organized crime. Rallying the crowds behind the government's war is becoming increasingly difficult. The most visible result of the policy has been escalating violence. But President Calderon's right-hand man, his Minister for Public Security, is convinced challenging organized crime will pay off over time. There is always a peak of violence at first. But in every previous case, in New York, Chicago, Palermo, Medellin, the violence began to go down after four to five years. Yes, it's a difficult time and uh, many people have died. Uh, but this is a period that uh, really uh, marks a turning point and history is unkind uh, when you get to a turning point, you fail to turn. The U.S. government says Mexico has finally begun to tackle corruption at the highest levels. The head of Interpol in Mexico and a top government anti-drug advisor have been arrested. Both of them accused of taking money from the drug cartels. 
but those who refuse to take bribes have more to fear than prison. Plata or plomo, say Mexicans, silver or lead. Those who can't be bought with money are eliminated with bullets. Hundreds of honest policemen, soldiers, judges and their families have been butchered for saying no to the drug lords. As long as men like Chapo Guzman can walk free, many Mexicans feel their government is hopelessly compromised. Ciudad Juarez, a desert city on the border with Texas. This is the ultimate trading post between Mexico and the United States. It's also the jewel in the crown of Mexico's drug trafficking. Chapo Guzman is fighting to rule here too. The result is hell on earth. Two and a half thousand people were executed in Ciudad Juarez last year. Today, this is the most murderous city on earth. The drug war in Juarez has thrown up an unlikely hero. A softly spoken law professor, Jose Reyes was elected mayor two years ago. Ever since, he's been on a mission to win people's trust. Um, Reyes, I'm Cassie Adler from the BBC. How are you? Nice, Good. To, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Too. As soon as he took office, the mayor discovered that corruption was endemic in the local police force. The operational chief of the police that was there before I came in was stopped going into the United States with a ton of marijuana. He was, he was the number two guy in the police department, and he was stopped uh, crossing a ton of marijuana himself. Immediately, right the day I came in, I fired all of the heads. Everybody who's the head of the uh, police department was out that day. Half the Juarez police force was found to be corrupt and dismissed. Dozens of city officials involved in the purge were murdered in retaliation. The mayor's life remains under threat. And some of the killings were done by police officers. Uh, imagine half of the police department being involved in, in something like that. With only 800 officers left, the mayor launched a huge recruitment drive to give Juarez a new police force free from corruption. I wanted to meet one of the mayor's police cadets, but not many were prepared to be interviewed on camera. Eventually, we found one brave enough to do so. Oh, wow. Como Charlie's angel. Yes. No? <laughs> Blanca del Rio is a young mother of three. No, no tengo miedo. Me lo pregunta mi mamá. ¿Tienes miedo? Y así como se lo contesta usted, ahí sí se lo contesta ella. No, no tengo miedo. No corrompirnos o no ser corruptos. Esa es nuestra meta, llegar a ser unos buenos policías. Blanca's father was also a policeman. He was murdered on duty 20 years ago, leaving her mother alone with nine children. Christian? ¿Tienes opinión? Estás orgulloso de tu mamá. Estás orgulloso de tu mamá. Tiene mucho coraje. Mm -hmm. Christian knows far more about the dangers of Juarez than any six-year-old should. When his father opened a new shop, the cartels demanded protection money. Entonces a él le pidieron cierta cantidad, no la pudo reunir y al momento que la reunió, pues Ya se le había vencido el plazo, fue por eso que... De hecho, el niño estaba ahí con él cuando pasó eso. Se lo había llevado una semana. 
Blanca's husband was murdered in front of their son, Christian. It happened only two months ago. While Blanca and the other new police cadets complete their training, the streets of Juarez are patrolled by federal forces, sent in by President Calderón. I joined them for an afternoon patrol. Where is it? There, in front. We don't cross there. Apparently the execution took place in, inside that petrol station. You can see inside the police cars on the, on the crime scene they've got masks on because for them it's a matter of life and death and, you know, people recognise them, the wrong people know where they are. That can cost them their lives or, or put their families' lives in danger. A man has been shot in the centre of town in broad daylight. There should be plenty of witnesses. But people here rarely talk to the police. I keep thinking what it must be like to, to live in Juarez and know the danger you run of being in the wrong place at the wrong time every single day on one of those buses, walking out with your kid from school. And one of those gunmen just come past and spray the roads to attack one of their enemies. But, you know, you can just get in the firing line. Soon, our patrol receives another call. There's police and soldiers all around the car, bullet holes all through the windscreen and blood spattered all over the windscreen. The music is still playing in the car. In the scene of horror, absolute horror. These young men were all wearing similar badges. They were probably factory workers going home after their shift. It's hard to believe that each one of them was an intended target. And that this is a war with no innocent victims. What just makes this whole scene so surreal is, you know, you've got this horror scene. And just over there, so close by, that's the United States over that fence. You've got US custom officials looking on at the mess that Mexico's in. This is one of the bridges crossing from Juarez into El Paso, Texas. To ordinary Mexicans, it symbolizes the chance of a better life. To Chapo Guzman and other drug traffickers, it's a prized gateway to their business of death. Across the border from Mexico is the world's largest consumer of drugs, America. Where have you found drugs and cars that have I mean, been inspected? It would, be, it would probably be a safer question for you to ask, where haven't we found drugs? Uh, your, your fender panels, your door panels, your roof, very drive shaft. We found it in uh, intake manifolds on the engines, air cleaners, in the tires. So where we haven't found it, I think maybe where you put the key in the ignition, how many drugs have you seized? This year, unofficially right now, we're, we're over 60 tons of that marijuana. You, that you seized right here? That's the total for, for the port. I don't have my uh, cocaine and heroin numbers, but it's, it's quite a bit, significantly less than that. And some methamphetamines and, and again, some pills. 
Cocaine consumption in the United States from the 1980s is down uh, almost 20, uh, more than 20 percent. But clearly, uh, one of the changes has been that uh, marijuana is the uh, chief uh, revenue generator. Prohibition is what makes marijuana so valuable. Many argue legalization would halve the Mexican cartel's profits overnight. For the American government, that's not an option. Legalization is, is not for uh, us a, a, an answer. Uh, it, it, it amounts to uh, throwing up our hands and conceding that uh, nothing can be done about that. The United States says it's helping Mexico with enhanced border cooperation and intelligence. It's also pledged $1.4 billion in aid. The two countries share a 2,000-mile border. There's fears the violence could spread into America. Yet less than a mile from deadly Ciudad Juarez, El Paso, Texas, remains one of the safest cities in the U.S. It's also one of the best armed. Whereas in Mexico, gun ownership is illegal, here in the United States, it's a right enshrined in law. Weapons are easily available in shops and gun shows across the country. That's a Russian Moise Gayan. Have you seen Enemy at the Gates, the movie? That's the gun. How much? How much? Uh, 395. I'll tell you what, if you buy the ammo for 390, I'll throw in the gun. All you have to do is look at Mexico. When people criticize our nation for our, our views on guns, look at Mexico and they're all enslaved and none of them have guns. But couldn't you say that in Mexico, because there are so many illegal weapons flushing about, that's that's what's but the illegal weapons, the but so the illegal no, the illegal weapons yeah. are in the hands of criminals, not us. Every time they pass a law, it hurts law-abiding people. It doesn't hurt criminals. Criminals don't care. To buy a gun from a licensed dealer in the U.S., you need a background check. But once the weapon is legally purchased, its owner can resell it, lose it or simply give it to someone without having to declare anything. Mexican criminals exploit this and use frontmen to buy weapons on their behalf. Preventing guns from falling into the wrong hands is a tall order. We went to meet the US agents who try to do just that. A number of firearms that have either been uh, seized as evidence, seized for forfeiture, abandoned, that we've come across in, in many different cases, many different ways. So when you see sort of multiple homicides in places like Ciudad Juarez, this is the kind of weapon that's going to be used? This, this will be one of them. Also, uh, you may have, uh, this is probably one of the most popular firearms that's seized in Mexico what is it? by organized crime. This is an AK-47. When weapons like this are seized in Mexico, their serial number is sent to the U.S. for further investigation. How many of those traced firearms found inside Mexico are coming from the United States? Uh, well, I believe the statistic right now is right at about 90 percent. Ninety percent of the thousands of traced weapons linked to Mexican drug cartels come from the U.S. in all shapes and sizes. This was the big ticket item, was a 50 caliber rifle. Now, a 50 caliber rifle is, is a firearm wow. that, uh, that has the ability to uh, penetrate armored vehicles or, or you know, walls on houses or, or whatever. Was it here in El Paso that it was bought? Yes, yes, it was purchased here in El Paso. Back in Mexico, the despair caused by the violence seems never ending. Fernando Segueda is still looking for his missing son. With other families of the disappeared, he's staging a protest outside Tijuana's most notorious crime scene. The man known as the Stewmaker confessed to dissolving corpses here. But the authorities told families there's no trace of their loved ones. We went to that place and uh, we didn't find nothing. Uh, 
really find uh, a, some kind of uh, indicios, quiero decir en español, I would like to say this word in English, indicios is an element, we didn't find in, uh, no one. Evidence? Evidence, we don't find evidence. Yeah. We were told a gelatinous substance was found here, but that it was so acidic that any DNA evidence was destroyed. Fernando doesn't believe it. Que sí existen y que están en ese lugar. Entonces hay que venir a escarbar ahí y eso a lo mejor lo vamos a hacer nosotros. Como le digo, quizás vamos a terminar en la cárcel, pero esta puerta la vamos a tirar y vamos a meternos allá que hay esquina y con picos y palas vamos a hacer el, el trabajo que la autoridad federal debió haber hecho hace mucho tiempo. We have to put in context also that these people, people who disappear, at people who participate with crime criminals. It's not uh, common people. The people who are representing them, their sons or families, are collaborating with uh, criminals. Mexico's dead and missing are tainted by suspicions of being linked to the drug world. Do you think it's possible? Sometimes I was thinking, when well, that moment say, okay, maybe. And I start talking with everybody. Tell me the truth, please. Maybe he was on something wrong. I say, no, no, no. Even the bad boys, the real ones, was in, the, you know, stolen cars or cylinders, they told us. He's a good boy. We don't know why. Who actually do you see as victims? You know, if, if you're saying that you, you think a lot of those who've been disappeared were involved in organized crime, do you not see them, therefore, as victims? No, claro que no, pero... No, of course I do. But we have to deal with the resources we have in Mexico. We have to be realistic about the possibilities available in the country. We have declared a war. A war that has never been declared before. But victory in the Mexican government's war appears ever more elusive. Despite the heavy deployment of forces in Ciudad Juarez, Murders have shot up tenfold since Chapa Guzman decided to try and conquer the city. For ordinary Mexicans, the human cost of the drug war is intolerable. This is one victim whose innocence surely no one can dispute. Josiel Ramirez lived and went to school across the border in Texas. He'd come to Juarez for the day to see his father. He was deliberately shot in the head as he crawled out of his father's car, ambushed by gunmen. Josiel Ramirez was seven years old. It's sickening to be watching out for your children, afraid they might get hurt because of the evil you have done. You don't want it to happen to them. It's very hard. This man had reason to fear. A former hitman for the Juarez cartel, he agreed to talk about the drug war if we hid his identity. Shortly after I met him, he too was executed. His final words to me were about the roots of the violence and the only way he believed it would end. Chapo wants that bridge over there. He wants the bridge to send goods up to the gringos. That's the fight, in case you don't know. As long as the gringos keep asking for marijuana, because that's what they use the most, deaths will continue here. Mexico is doomed. Mexico is doomed. If today there are 20 dead, Tomorrow there will be even more, until that bridge has one sole owner. If you're in the shoes of an average Mexican citizen, and you see that the government has huge levels of corruption, that the police have been infiltrated, that when you report a crime, you become not the victim, but you become the persecuted. And on top of that, you see a failed strategy that is being implemented. Uh, very likely, first of all, you will start saying, 
let's negotiate with organized crime groups. Let's just negotiate with this guy so the violence stops. As violence rages along the border, Chapo Guzman remains at large, thought to be somewhere in his Sinaloa stronghold. His contempt for the authorities remains brazen. The press has reported sightings of Chapo eating at local restaurants. And at 54 years of age, he recently got married to an 18-year-old beauty queen from the Sinaloa mountains. Newspapers reported Chapo got married to this girl with a big party in broad daylight and that the party was allegedly watched over by the Mexican army. I received information from people close to some of the guests who said that several governors were there too. If that wasn't enough, the respected American business magazine Forbes estimated Chapo's fortune at a billion dollars and recently rated him the 41st most powerful man in the world. The Mexican president isn't even on the list. La corrupción es el principal problema en México. Corruption is Mexico's main problem. Until corruption is uprooted, there will be no end to poverty, impunity, kidnappings and a number of problems my country suffers from. The best example of corruption is Chapo Guzman. Economic support system, security support system and political support system. Without those three, someone like Chapo Guzman cannot grow to the level that he has grown. Journalists told us, ordinary people told us, they believe that politicians are protecting Chapo Guzman. How do you convince them that they're wrong? Let me tell you, there is no precedent in the history of this country to what this government has done so far. This government has fought against all the drug cartels, including Chapo Guzman's cartel. Many people have died. Police officers have died in this battle against Chapo Guzman. After weeks of witnessing Mexico's drug wars, I began seeing this country as a place haunted by ghosts. The stories of missing victims and elusive criminals often stem from a common source. Mexico's long history of impunity. I convinced the authorities to let me visit the site where Santiago Mesa, the stew maker, confessed to disposing of his victims. It was the only chance Fernando and Sandra would have to be allowed in. The authorities insist no identifiable human remains were ever found here. But Fernando and Sandra aren't prepared to give up on their son. Yeah. This is Sosa Caustica. Maybe, maybe my son is here. Fernando is possible to stay here. Stay there or there. I don't know. What happened with him? And try, try continue living. I really need it. I, I need to know what happened with my son. God give it my son, but I don't know why he took it from me. Soon it'll be three years since a young Mexican man was abducted. This may be as close as his parents will ever get to finding him. In Ciudad Juarez, it's the eve of the graduation ceremony for over a thousand new police cadets brought in to replace their corrupt predecessors. Sí, 
No, hijo, ten cuidado. Dame la bebé. A single mother of three, Blanca is about to take on a huge responsibility on behalf of her family, her city, her country. Dame un besito ya, dale. Ya. ¿Sí? Está bien. ¿Sale? A partir de este día, cuando comiencen sus patrullajes, tengan siempre en cuenta que fueron preparados para representar a la ley, para ganar la lucha contra el mal y vencer cualquier tentación que los desvíe de su camino. Les espera una tarea difícil. Muchas gracias por su amor por Juárez. Felicidades a toda la nueva policía. The mayor of Juarez has been waiting two years for this day. His hopes for the city and his personal legacy rest on these young men and women. Porta ese uniforme con mucho orgullo, eh. Hágalo por el bien de Juarez. Muchas felicidades. You know, today at the at the ceremony, watching um, not just the new policemen, but their families, mothers, fathers, and their and their children. It's the first time since we've been traveling in Mexico that you feel a sense of hope, or at least of wanting to hope. You know that these guys really can bring peace to the streets of Juarez. That's that's what they're promising to do, and at the same time, hoping very, very, very much that with these little amount of training that people like Blanca have had, that they're not going to be lambs going to slaughter. of the powerful Sinaloa drug cartel. Ambushes are not uncommon. Mexico is one of the biggest producers of marijuana in the world, and it's here that most of it is grown. The Mexican army took me on the marijuana trail. I'd like to say we can smell our way, but it's not quite true. I think we have about half an hour of this. At least I got rid of the heavy flak jacket. The army says we're in safe hands now. They say they've secured the area. The soldiers had recently discovered five hectares of cannabis plantations. To reach the fields meant a long and humid trek. You can smell it. 
smell it. Now I can smell it. Just imagine what it's going to be like when they start burning it. The Mexican army says it burnt hundreds of tons of marijuana last year. Yet more than 60% of the drug cartel's annual revenue, or an estimated $8 billion, is thought to come from sales of marijuana to the United States. You are eradicating, but there's still so many drugs being grown here in, in Mexico. In muchos de los casos, pues no alcanzamos a destruir todas las drogas. Y no a todos los rincones y a todos los puntos con los efectivos que tenemos podemos llegar. Hacemos nuestro mejor esfuerzo, erradicamos un gran número de plantíos, un gran número de hectáreas, pero faltan algunas que no alcanzamos a erradicar y son las que cosechan y son las que llegan a los consumidores. The man who profits from this vast illegal trade here in Sinaloa is the most wanted man in Mexico, Joaquín Guzmán Loera, better known as El Chapo. The illiterate son of marijuana growers, Chapo Guzmán is believed to be hiding in these mountains where he was born. El Chapo, Guzmán nació Chapo Guzmán was born in a community that has always made a living from the drug trade. You need to understand this to understand why Chapo would enter this business when he was a child. This is a region where most people don't actually look down on the drug trade, but rather see it as a way to make a living, to survive. But the drug business in Mexico is now a massive criminal enterprise. It includes the trafficking of 90% of all the Colombian cocaine consumed in the United States. Profits are estimated at $15 billion a year. Rival drug cartels are fighting to control the lucrative border routes into the United States. One cartel is coming out on top. It's now one of the most powerful and violent drug trafficking organizations in the world the Sinaloa cartel of Chapo Guzman. Chapo and his men are blamed for much of the bloodshed in Mexico. They go to the rooms, say, wake up, stand up. Say, but why, why you take him? They never told me anything. The men push us my daughter and me, and they took him, put in the car, and gone. Santa called me, and my surprise is, why, Fernando, why? And then he said, well, what can I do? I go to the police station, and I, I talk with the officer, say, somebody take my son, and I need to know if my son is here. And then, uh, where's the name? Blah, blah, blah. Fernando Segueda Ruelas. No, it's not here. Fernando realized the men in uniform had been criminals in disguise. But the real police were not exactly helpful. Fernando drove to six different police stations in Tijuana before he was allowed to file a missing persons report. I go to the Central Caminera and Central Caminera tell me, no, this is not a pen to here. You need to go to the Zona Rio. I go to Zona Rio and say, no, you go to Florido. Florido, no. Uh, you go to the playas of Tijuana. My son disappeared completely and they don't want to know nothing. Fernando headed home, hoping the people who'd taken his son would get in touch. The police officer said, maybe this is a kidnap. You need to wait for the call. For now, we're still waiting for the call. No call. Nobody calls. Nobody call. To get to the source of the suffering of so many Mexicans like Fernando and Sandra, I needed to travel through Mexico's mountainous interior. Criminal organizations have thrived here for decades, smuggling narcotics north into the United States. 
The cost to the Mexican people, though, has never been this high. The public brutality of the killings has terrorized whole communities. And hundreds of people like Fernando and Sandra's son have simply disappeared. I traveled 900 miles south of Tijuana to a rarely visited part of the country, the state of Sinaloa. It's here that Mexico's drug trade was born on the lush tropical mountains of the Sierra Madre. Well, it's dusty, but it's also dangerous. There is no way we'd be able to travel through this country in or outside a car without coming with the army. This is the A war is raging in Mexico's border towns as rival drug cartels battle for control. In the scene of horror. The Mexican government has declared its own war on the drug barons. It seems powerless to stem the tide of bloodshed. The drug gangs here are as heavily armed as the security forces. In a million years would I expect to find something like this here in Mexico. People come here on a holiday. Thousands have died or simply disappeared, mourned by their families. I need to know what happened with my son. It's all about supplying thousands of tons of cocaine and cannabis to the United States. This is the man behind much of the violence. Chapo Guzman is the world's most powerful drug lord and Mexico's most wanted man. Welcome to Tijuana, tequila, sex, or marijuana. Welcome to Tijuana. This is Tijuana, Mexico's most notorious border town. For decades, it was a magnet for American tourists, seeking easy, seedy pleasures away from home. But tourists no longer feel welcome here. It wasn't long before I saw why. Hola, ¿qué pasó aquí exactamente? Un muerto. Eh, eh, ¿Se lo sabe quién, quién era? No, por el momento todavía. No. This man with no name was my first encounter with violent death in Mexico, and I had only just arrived. Rival drug cartels use murder and terror in their battle for control of the city, a key gateway into America. I'm mostly shocked, actually, the fact that there are not that many people crowding around to see what's happened. Because there's just been a murder taking place here. There's loads of restaurants around here, loads of people, lights. It's not some dark alleyway. Are they just so used to murders here that they just shrug their shoulders? Or is it an indication of how violent this city really is, that people don't want to come anywhere near, they don't want to be seen on the scene? Seguimos con miedo. ¿Quieren seguir con ese miedo? ¿Qué es lo que nos puede pasar? ¿Qué nos puede pasar? Nada. Nos matan. This is a deeply religious country, but it's also a society gripped by fear. Executions and kidnaps are daily events in Mexico's border towns, where every parish is mourning its dead. Most crimes go unpunished, and those affected are often too scared to even talk. Los pecados. Espero la resurrección de los muertos y la vida del mundo futuro. Amen. Feeling abandoned by the authorities, many find strength in their faith. Están dispuestos a luchar. 
viva mi Cristo, que viva mi Rey, que impere doquiera, triunfante su ley. Viva Cristo Rey, viva Cristo there have been more than 16,000 drug killings in the last three years alone. Authorities say it's just a case of criminals killing criminals, and they rarely investigate the murders. But is it that simple? I went to meet a family affected by the violence. They believe this country's victims are being ignored and have chosen to speak out for them. Hello. Hello. I'm Katia. Hi. I'm Fernando. Hi. Pleased to meet you, Fernando. Hi, I'm Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Nice to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Thank you for having me in your home. Thank you. Fernando Osegueda is a salesman. His wife Sandra no longer works. They have three children. The firstborn is called Fernando, like his father. Do you remember that when he started school? Yeah. It was exciting to go to school. When he wake up early the first day. He loved the school. Did he? Really? So, yeah, that's he un- I mean, that's unusual. Yeah, because yeah. my second one, who say, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to school. He cried all the time. This is the last picture we have. Christmas Eve. Age 23, Fernando was about to graduate as an engineer. There was no hint of the trouble to come. But on the 10th of February 2007, everything changed. That day I was outside with my neighbors. The car came and stopped in front of the house. It looked like police officers, you know. You know, they have guns. Say so maybe they're looking for somebody here, my neighbors or something. They they start using the steps, and they open my door. They came in and started yelling, "Why are you coming to my house? You need to show me something." As five men in police uniform barged into the house. Ten more stood guard by their cars. The neighbors retreated indoors. That day was my daughter in her room and one of my son, Fernando, was in his room. To get rid of the drug trade in Mexico, you need to get rid of the bosses, right? And you've got the big boss, Chapo Guzman, who comes from here. Yo le, yo le digo lo que yo considero, sí, y el avance que tenemos constantemente y el trabajo que hacemos con constancia, esfuerzo y determinación. ¿Y lo, eh, eh, Chapo Guzmán dónde está? No lo sé. ¿Usted tuvo la experiencia de estar cerca de él o con, con, no, no, con no, llamadas no, no, que nunca, puede estar en nunca, un...? Nunca, no, no. Y no sabemos exactamente dónde se encuentra. ¿Do you think he is here? No lo sé. ¿Do you, think you'll, fi- do you think you'll find him? ¿Do you really find him? ¿Lo encontrará? Estimo que sí. Sí. Bueno, mucho gusto. Gracias. Mucho gusto. Hasta luego. Gracias. Hasta luego. At a nightclub in Sinaloa's capital, Culiacán, Chapo Guzman is celebrated in song. This one is called The Lord of the Mountain. It's a narco corrido, a traditional ballad about the lives and exploits of Mexico's drug lords. In this corrido, Chapo Guzman is a folk hero. Drug traffickers pay bands in Sinaloa and all over the country to compose corridos about them. Songs that defend them, glorify them and say they're very brave. Javier Valdez is a well-known newspaper columnist in Culiacán. He's also a vocal critic of Sinaloa's drug culture. 
¿Quieres corrido? No, no, quería preguntar solamente. Gracias. When we talk about like the drug traffickers and the drug lords, I mean, Chapo Guzman is your drug lord, the drug lord of Culiacán. Is there something special about him? People admire him, they love him and give him protection. Because Chapo is from this area, but also because he has a lot of power and money, and he pays well. Culiacán is a dangerous place, but it's also a relatively prosperous city. The proceeds of drug trafficking are laundered into the region's economy and its infrastructure, seeping deep into the social fabric. We have relatives who are drug traffickers, neighbors, customers. The traffickers are in our kitchens, in our bedrooms, on our patios. They are amongst us because they benefit us. <laughs> Not everyone in Mexico is doing well, 